Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today with Judy Ness alongside Aperture's Professional Learning Manager, Kim Williams. They are presenting today on essential SEL strategies and skill building to facilitate in the first weeks of school, wherever that occurs. My name is Emily, and I'm going to walk you through the Zoom system before we get started. The webinar is being recorded, and everyone will receive a replay at the end of the presentation. If you are having trouble seeing your screen, or I'm sorry, seeing the slides, you should first exit the full screen. If you still can't see the slides, you can double click on the small box on the top middle of your screen and that should bring up the slide deck. You should see two really cute pictures on your screen. You should also see the three functions at the bottom of the screen. The chat feature can be used to ask questions or share any tech issues. But we can also use it to let us know your name, uh, your district or organization, and your job title. So why don't you guys go ahead and try that out for me. There is also the Q&A button, which is where you can pose any questions for the presenters. And we will get to those at the end of the presentation. And finally, the raise the hand function. This feature can be used if there are any tech issues. If you raise your hand, I or one of my team members will reach out to you uh, via private chat to address any issues. Like I said, we will be having a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So submit any questions in that Q&A box for us. Uh, we will also have polls in today's session. I'm actually going to launch one now if you guys can select one answer for me. I'm gonna leave this up while I do our introductions. The last piece I have for you today before we get into those introductions is that we do offer professional development certificates for your attendance at the webinar. You will receive one within 24 hours of the presentation. So a little bit about our speakers today. Our speakers have many combined years of experience in the world of SEL. They both strongly believe in the powerful effects of building lifelong social and emotional skills for all children, preschool through high school. To go along with the idea of continually developing SEL skills, you see here a picture of Judy in kindergarten and Kim in high school. They may look a little bit like sisters, but they're not, and they have enjoyed a long collaborative working relationship and friendship for many years. To tell you a little bit more about Judy, she has a long list of accomplishments, especially in the social emotional learning space. And so I'm going to give you the condensed version of her impressive background. She is currently an instructor at Rutgers University. She is a former SEL specialist consultant for CASEL collaborating, collaborating district initiative in Austin, Sacramento, Cleveland, and El Paso. She's a former director of SEL for Harrisburg School District in Pennsylvania. She is a former director and principal of a private school in early childhood education. And she's also a former classroom teacher. She's finally, finally um, she is, she's authored the strategies in, the, in support of the creation of our educator SEL program, the educator social emotional reflection and training or EdCert program, you'll all be receiving a copy of our special edition Optimistic Thinking EdCert Guide following today's webinar. So you can check out Judy's ideas on how to bring optimistic thinking into your educational setting. And finally, to tell you a little bit about Aperture's Kim Williams, she has a long run in the SEL space as well, having been immersed in social emotional learning starting in 2001. Kim has coached teachers in classrooms as they have implemented evidence-based SEL programs is a teacher for two evidence-based <laughs> SEL programs and has experience supporting SEL work in nonprofits, universities, and statewide organizations. While not an official teacher, Kim has widespread experience about adult, in adult learning and guiding educators in the process, structures, policies, and resources to support the whole child using SEL programs. Kim's work has provided her the opportunity to travel both nationally and internationally to train and hear, er, and her uh, has provided her the opportunity, I'm sorry people, <laughs> has uh, <laughs> gone internationally to support educators in their SEL work. Her most memorable experience was training educators for the PATHS program in Shanghai, China. 
If you're a partner with Aperture Education, there's a great chance Kim has been part of your journey as you have learned more about how to use the DESA comprehensive system since she leads our professional development efforts in our professional learning as our professional learning manager. That was a whole lot, so I appreciate you bearing with me. But with that, Judy, I am going to turn it over to you as I end and share this poll. All right, thank you, Emily. Now the sharing is just on, on the video for us, right? Yeah. Yes, you should be seeing okay. the poll results now. Okay, very good. Welcome everybody. We're really glad that you're here with us today. Um, thanks for joining us. Yeah, we put our pictures in this first slide on purpose. We wanted to, sh to remind everybody of what it looks like to feel excited and happy as a first grader, ready to learn. I have a first grader grandchild and I know uh, that excitement. But also take a look at a 12th grader, ready for the social life of a traditional 12th grader and wanting to graduate as an, as an adult on time, ready to manage adult problems and to sustain well-being. Before we begin, Let's all take a calm, focused breath, inhaling through our nose and slowly exhaling through the mouth. Do that two times and you really feel good. This calming, focused breath is one of the essential SEL skills we will be using here this afternoon. I'm sure you are already feeling a stronger sense of focus and the calm benefits of this social and emotional skill of self-management. Students who know how to use this breath to calmly focus have the ability to use their self-awareness to help them do well with their learning. Today, we hope to accomplish these goals. We want to enhance everybody's understanding of SEL we want to show you some explicit SEL skills that we think are essential for the first weeks of school. We want to remind you of the value of explicit direct instruction. We will be reviewing some protocols that you will get as handouts later on. And we want to improve the potential of student learning outcomes. Always that's our main goal. And now Kim is going. Hi, Go ahead, Kim. Oh, All right. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Kim Williams, and we're going to get to Judy's great strategies in just a few minutes and the meat of our presentation. But first, I wanted to do just a quick review for you about what we know about social emotional learning and set the stage for Judy. I'm sure that most of you are pretty familiar, familiar with this CASEL research that we have on the screen that really highlights the importance of developing and using social emotional skills. You know, it's really important we know to have um, young people learn how to identify and regulate their emotions, develop those positive relationships and help them set up for making good responsible decisions. Uh, our ultimate goal um, is good outcomes for young people. And by building uh, SEL skills in those young people, we also help to build a learning culture that is safe and respectful and supportive. What does SEL do for us now and what does SEL do for us in the future? Um, SEL can be a really great lever for building equity in the classroom. It can also really help to generate greater young adult outcomes, as you see here from this 2015 public health study. Um, what the study was about is that youth who were fortunate enough to learn SEL skills when they were in kindergarten were more likely to graduate from high school, complete a college degree, secure a stable work into their 20s, and at the same time, they were also less likely as adults to live in public housing, receive public housing assistance, be involved with the police or a detention facility. Um, and so what we know is that um, for kindergartners, SEL really helps to predict their future wellness. Um, and so this really helps us to understand that as we build SEL skills in young people, um, it has a really long lasting benefit 
And so if you're interested in knowing more about the study, because this is really fascinating to me to think about that predictive ability of SEL skills in kindergartners, um, you'll see the citation there at the bottom of the screen um, and, and can look that up. It's uh, early social emotional functioning and public health, the relationship between kindergarten social competence and future wellness. I'm sure for many of you, this is a familiar graphic that you've seen before. It's the castle of the cognitive academic and social emotional learning and the five competencies, along with um, what we added to this particular graphic are the smaller groups or skills that go into those competencies. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to drill down into these smaller skill sets and those individual skills. Um, these are the skills that Judy's going to be talking about that we um, know must be explicitly taught. And there are actually many SEL programs that meet CASEL Select Program Guide criteria that typically teach these individual skills. And so Judy will point out to you some specific strategies for several different programs today as she shares some simple ways for you to kick off the school year by incorporating SEL skills into your education environment. And what's important to know about that is what Judy's going to share with you today and the skills that you see here on the screen are skills that can be taught and modeled and reinforced, whether you are doing in person learning, whether you're working in a hybrid learning environment or why, whether you're working in a virtual learning environment. And when I looked back at our poll from the very beginning of our session, I saw that the majority of you are planning to be in a hybrid learning environment. So definitely would want to encourage you to think about how you're going to incorporate those strategies in that environment. As we think about these different behaviors and the strategies that we can use to incorporate, incorporate them into everyday learning, we also want to think about how and where we observe them in an educational environment as well. You know, it's not just during the SEL lesson time, it's every day that we're going to see these skills being built. And so that's where the work that we do at Aperture Education with the DESA Comprehensive System and the social emotional assessments come into play. The DESA assessments can help you know where students are with their social emotional skills and then the areas where they need it from you know, universal instruction or receive targeted supports to increase their social emotional competence um, or their individual needs as well. So since we know it's important to explicitly teach SEL and we're doing that with all of our students, um, and we want to also support those students who have specific identified areas for growth. We want to be able to measure that growth and that's what the DESA can help us to do. And the easiest way that we know to do that is through observation. So just like we measure growth in reading and math, um, teachers can observe the growth in those student skills. We can also do that with SEL skills and um, that's how Aperture and DESA can help you. So just to take a quick consideration for um, how you might want to consider or why you might want to consider measuring students' social emotional competence. Um, you know, you might want to screen all of your students to identify um, those who need some additional support. You might want to monitor progress to see if their social emotional competence is improving or in this uncertain time as we're going from um, you know, uh, virtual learning to hybrid learning, we might want to see where they're having growth as well. And um, also, if you're using a universal SEL program, you can use it to determine how well that program is being implemented. What you see here on our graphic is the CASEL standards, along with the eight competencies that the DESA measures. And I'll just give you a couple of um, examples of how the DESA connects to those CASEL standards. So, for example, on the CASEL wheel, when we looked at um, when we looked at uh, self-awareness. Uh, the castle, uh, one of the behaviors on castle was self-identity or perceptions. And when we use the DESA, we have questions related to can that student make accurate statements about his or her life? And so we can see that connection there. Also for relationship skills, um, on the castle wheel, we have the idea of social engagement. And on the DESA, we have relationship skills questions. And for example, one of them is, do they do something nice for somebody? So currently, your, um, your, uh, we can do the death assessment for grades K through 12. And as I start to turn over our session to my friend and colleague, Judy, um, she'll begin to share with you some simple strategies that you can use 
to um, transition back to school. And I would encourage you to think about um, how you can incorporate those strategies into your SEL work. So Judy, I'm gonna turn it back over to you now. Well, thank you, friend. Kim, very well done. So calendars tell us it's back to school time. While school boards, districts, and schools are trying to figure out where school should be held. Given, given this is a season of pandemic, sorry, I missed, missed, I missed a spot there. All right, next slide, please. So this pandemic has caused many things to change, especially in how the education system operates. But everything does not need to change. If you already had social emotional learning or SEL in place last year, as many of you likely had, it's probably been much easier for you to do your outreach for your parents since March. Or if you are just starting to implement SEL, now is the time. So what's in your backpack? So learning is emotional, social, and academic. SEL skills are essential for learning. SEL skills help calm learners and sustain their focus in learning that is challenging. Peers help learners acquire SEL skills because learning is social. SEL enhances academic learning. Now, as a profession, we educators need to fill our backpacks with instructional habits of practice that incorporate skill building. Here's what I mean by explicit instruction. As on the handouts you will receive, skill building is essential. And this means using explicit instruction of SEL skills, the teacher modeling of skills, the student modeling of skills, a cueing or prompting skill of the teacher to reinforce the work throughout the day, and practice. We, we need to follow each of these four uh, categories so that we can really uh, have our students learn the process. In 2003, many of our highly regarded SEL scholars and researchers such as Roger Riceberg, Joseph Sins, Mark Greenberg, Mary Utney O'Brien, Maurice Elias, and others cited that the importance of instruction of SEL skills for learning and thriving. Here's one quote, quote from that work. Social and emotional skills are important for child development during normal times and especially during crises. So the time is now. Kim and I are going to turn our cameras on now because we actually are going to explicitly teach to you six different skills we have selected here on this chart. Um, to, uh, we will be presenting them and, and showing you how we would go through the process of instruction in the classroom. You will receive an explicit instructional protocol handout for each one of these. Implementing and embedding these instructional strategies of social and emotional skills in your classroom community, wherever it meets during the first weeks of school is what effective teachers do. So we're going to begin with a calm breath, which we use for focusing. A calm, focused breath. So I open today's session with a quick, calm, focused breath. It is a signal to self and others that the learning pace is changing. Calm, focused breath helps to enhance self-control, attitude, attention, and prepares the cognition part of the brain. I will model and explain the steps of calm, focused breath with Kim's help. In this case, I'm going to be the teacher and she will be the instructor in some of the cases. So when I teach calm, 
focused breath, I use a Hoberman rainbow sphere. It looks like this. And, and the steps go like this. We're going to open it as you breathe in and we're gonna close it as you breathe out as though it is dip, uh, replicating what your belly is doing, like a belly breath. So the sphere mirrors what happens to our bellies when we breathe deeply. So let's try this together. Breathe in deeply with through your nose. Notice how the belly expands. Then exhale through the mouth. Notice how the belly collapses. Now think about how you felt before the breath and think about how you feel now. Is there a difference? And think of the times during the day at school and at home to use calming focused breath to calm your emotions. So Kim is going to be our student and she's gonna have her turn at modeling the same skill. Kim, your turn. Okay, Judy, so I know that I'm supposed to breathe deeply. Yeah, now are you on camera also? Yes. Okay. Yes. Breathe deeply in through the mouth and then slowly out through the, I'm sorry, breathe in deeply through the nose and slowly out through the mouth. Do you feel like you have okay, that? I think when I was first doing it, I was, yeah, when I was first doing it, I was breathing in and out through my mouth. So I'll have to change that for next time. I'm sorry, that was my mistake. So we're gonna breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. How's that okay. feel? I think I got it. Helps me feel much calmer. All righty. Um, so I'm going to cue you as, as, as we do as teachers, cue or prompt, meaning that I'm going to ask you to, do, to use this skill throughout the day. And because we won't really be in school today, I'm just going to ask you to go ahead and be looking, uh, I'll be looking for you doing your calming breath when we practice problem solving later in our session today. So okay. let's, uh, all right, let's everyone practice two calming focused breaths together. Coming in through the nose and out through the mouth. And one more. And one, out through the no mouth. We recommend you use a calm corner along with the calm focused breath. Calm corner or peace corner is a comfortable, safe and accessible spot in your classroom for students who need something more than a calm, focused breath. They may need to deescalate or take a breath from the current learning activity. You can have several copies of the calm, focused breath in the calm corner along with stickers, pictures of natural landscapes, emotional vocabulary cards and journal paper to help the student regain focus and return back to learning on her own without intervention by the teacher. So that's a time saver. All right, we're going to move into something called Charter of Common Agreements. Most students arrive at school this year, wherever school is, are missing a great sense of belonging from, from last year that should anchor them out in the world and help them define who they are. This is their very self-esteem, their self-efficacy, their self-awareness. This year, most children and youth have been like displaced persons, displaced away from their social peers. They may not have known where they belong outside their homes of quarantine. In the early days of the school year, as well as throughout the year, we must focus on the development of self-awareness and self-regulation, that our students strengthen their knowledge of self, that they clarify their vision of who they can become despite disruptions of worldwide illness, and that, how to, that they come to learn how to manage themselves in social learning groups while they skillfully solve problems that arise in their learning. 
In developing common agreements, we are asking students how, will, how they will manage themselves in the social learning group. Mark Brackett, an emotion scientist and professor at Yale University's Child Study Center, describes the family group charter in his new book, Permission to Feel. Here, we have adapted its protocol from family use to classroom use. The idea is that the class itself, this is whoever they are and wherever they are, develops a common understanding of how they want to feel, how they want to work together, and how they want to be supported and to support each other in their learning group. Here are the steps we take to develop a charter of common agreements. Step number one would be to generate a list of emotions as the group response to this question. What emotions do you want to feel at school in our learning group? So Kim, I'm asking that you to pretend to be a student of our group. What emotions do you want to feel at school in our learning group? Um, I'd like to feel happy and uh, I'd like to feel safe. Um, and I'd like to feel um, in, in included or um, part of the group. I want to feel, feel uh, uh, about the other people I work with. Right, and I think that's how most children would like to feel as well. Now we would discuss how they can help their particular, these particular emotions occur more frequently for members. And then we translate the emotions into action statements. And the common agreements are charted, decorated, and posted with student signatures. And, and Kim, when we took the uh, feelings that you talked about, you and I in advance came up with two ways to make that happen. So one of them was, do you see, do you see where we are? I'm sorry, I went ahead a little bit here. We can remind class members to social distance so we all feel healthy. You remember the student felt healthy, felt satisfied and happy. So to make them feel more, have more of that feeling, it was decided to remind the class to social distance so that we all feel healthy. The other plan was to help a class member who has a learning problem so he or she can feel satisfied with their schoolwork. And that word satisfied is an emotion word that students like to feel when they're doing their work. And Kim, um, we made up a pretend uh, common agreement. Would you like to read that for us, please? Sure, absolutely. Um, in our learning community, we want to feel more to feel more happy, satisfied, healthy, and proud with um, and satisfied with our learning. So these are the actions that we're gonna take to make those feelings occur more frequently in our classroom or in our virtual environment too, I think. Um, so we'll remind each other to social distance and wear our masks if we're doing in-person learning. So it helps us to feel healthy. Um, we're gonna help each other um, if someone's having a problem so we can feel uh, satisfied with our schoolwork and helping our, our peers with their schoolwork. Um, and we'll set a goal to make each of these statements become a truth. Um, and we'll talk about them um, regularly so that we can know whether or not we need to change them or how well we're doing with them. And all of us in our class signed it. And I love that when we signed it, we put it up in our classroom so we can see it and be reminded of it too. Right, and as you said, we would monitor that by checking it weekly to see how we're doing. We probably would do that in our morning meeting or our closing day circle. So thank you. So the bracket, yeah. hand, the bracket handout for this oh. protocol can be adapted for the classroom or shared with families for home use. When a group of students and their teachers go through the process of developing common agreements, they respectfully agree to learn well together and experience the emotions of learning. So we want those emotions, good, bad, or otherwise, to be happening in our classrooms. All right, the next skill we're going to learn today is effective listening position. This is called effective listening position because it works. 
effective listening position is first about body position. I will teach and model this as though Kim is one of my listeners. So Kim, I hope you could see me. As mm -hmm. a listener, your eyes are on the speaker. Your body is facing the speaker, whether it's sitting or standing. Your hands and feet are still, and the listener is quiet, not talking to a friend. The listener's hand may have a pen or pencil ready to take notes about what is being said. Kim, show us how you model effective listening position. I'm looking at you and I'm facing you and my hands and feet are still and I'm using my ears to hear what you're saying, Judy. Well done, well done. And that's what we want to see when we say effective listening position. So to cue Kim on this, I would say, what are some of the other times you will use effective listening position, Kim? Um, probably when I'm going to the art room for um, art class so I can hear what the art teacher has to tell me, or maybe in gym when the gym teacher is telling me how to um, play the game that we're going to play today. Or um, I can probably even use it when my friend is talking to me so that I can make sure that I'm really paying attention to what they want to tell me. Wonderful. Is there a time at home you might use it? Uh, I probably can use it when my parents are um, speaking to me and asking me to do something. And uh, maybe when we have dinner together at night and we're eating our dinner, it'd probably be good to um, be a really good, effective listener to um, hear what the rest of my family may be during the day. Very good. And that would give you lots of practice, which we all need when we're learning these skills. All right, we're going to move on to what we call speaker power. So holding a tool for speaker power is a visual cue to the group that one speaker is speaking at a time then it is passed for others to share a voice. In this case, I'm the speaker, so I'm holding my particular speaker power tool. So to teach and model this, I would either sit up or, or stand with purpose as though I have important work. I would hold the speaker power tool and explain how it works. In this case, this is a pretend one. It doesn't work for real but it does work for speaker power in that it gives me the power in my group to have voice right now. And for others who want to have a voice, I would share it with them. Um, as you use it, remain sure of yourself, even if you lose your place in what you are trying to say. Make frequent eye contact with your audience and keep the audience interested. So I'm going to pass my piece, speaker power tool to Kim to model speaker power as a student. Kim? Okay, um, I have my tool. So I have the speaker power tool and I'm looking at you, Judy, my audience. And I'm gonna sit up real straight and I'm gonna feel confident in uh, what I'm going to tell you. And then um, I am going to make sure that if someone else would like to add to what I want to say, or they have a question about something that I had to, that I said, um, that I can pass the tool to them so that they also can have the power of being able to speak. Very well done. And in the classroom, we would post that those steps. And when children are modeling it, we would really check to see that they're following it very exactly. So Kim, to cue or prompt you to use this skill later on, you can use speaker power when you ask our audience for questions at the end of this session. Okay, I will do that. Thank you. And for practice, Kim, you can practice speaker power while learning in other classrooms and receiving teacher coaching if needed. All right, the next skill is complimenting and receiving a compliment. So giving a compliment to another person 
is an SEL skill. A person makes a compliment to another person as one way to initiate a relationship with that person. It means that the compliment giver has noticed something positive in the other person. A person feels good receiving a compliment and is more willing to be open to a relationship with the giver of the compliment. The compliment giver also experiences heightened self-esteem and self-confidence having given a compliment. There are several levels of content we might include in a compliment we make to someone. So the way you look, for example, that you're ready to learn, the things you have, you have such as a beautiful garden, things you do such as hiking, one word that describes you, such as friendly, the way you are, thoughtful of others, and things you are good at, for example, ice skating. Obviously, when we're starting to teach uh, complimenting, we would work with those levels at the at, in number one and two, things you do, you ride your bike, things you have, a really cool backpack, the way you look, you look really, uh, pretty in your new outfit today. And then we work on developing more meaningful compliments. So today I'm going to model a compliment. I, I want to compliment Kim Williams. I want to compliment you, Kim, about how at ease I am in your company. Notice I gave you eye contact when I complimented you. I could have given you this compliment in private but I chose this moment to give it so I could compliment you and acknowledge you in front of a large group. I hope you have noticed how friendly I was trying to be when I complimented you. Hi, Judy, thank you very much for your compliment. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Most adults know how to give a compliment, but they may not be good at receiving compliments. I could see Kim is good at receiving compliments. She probably receives many. She acknowledged the compliment and seemed to have received it with a good level of comfort. Now I'm gonna stop for a second here and, and tell you a couple of things. You may have noticed that in presenting the Charter of Common Agreements and complimenting, I did not use the explicit instruction model so that I could save some time in this particular session. Now, if I regularly taught like that in the classroom and didn't do particular parts of this, many students may not have gained sufficiently from my modeling only. They definitely did not get a chance to model giving, giving or accepting a compliment, and they had no opportunity to be cued to give a compliment or to practice the skill in class with guidance from me as the teacher. The Charter of Common Agreements is a process activity. So participa participation in the group's work matters for modeling and practice. Teachers can prompt or cue the use of, of particular skills in such a process like speaker power and common focus breathing. So this is just a reminder of the importance of the effectiveness of explicit instruction of particular SEL skills. The effectiveness works only if we use all four components of the explicit instructional model, which as you know is teacher model, a teach model, student modeling, cue or prompt, and practice. And now we're going to go to one of the most difficult SEL skills that we're going to be teaching and is one that we all really need to learn in our classrooms. Uh, we're going to experience problems every day in our classrooms, so it's important to teach this, this skill. As with all of the SEL skills, the, exp I'm sorry, the expectation is students continuously improving their skill development and competence as they progress through K-12 schooling, and so that as young adults, they have competence in each of the skills. Problems are a normal part of everyday life. Sometimes we feel upset or confused, something is troubling us, something is wrong, 
or we just need some help with a difficult situation. Here's the explicit instruction process with me teaching and modeling problem solving and students doing some practicing of SEL skills learned. So uh, let's first of all, think about some school related problems that might come up. For example, someone much larger than you begins to tease you or you see someone who looks upset or your friend asked to borrow a pencil, but you only have one pencil and you need it yourself. Or you want to ask your teacher a question, but she is talking to another student. Other not so typical problems might come up this year, such as, I forgot my mask today and the school nurse said the school has no more new masks right now. Or another student keeps moving their desk closer to mine, which is too close for virus safety. Or I am really worried about getting the virus at school. I want to go to school at home. I've been coughing all night long. I'm worried I have the virus. I'm having trouble with this math. We started to do it last year, but then school closed without notice. Well, adult life is mostly about solving problems and making decisions. Being able to solve a problem is an SEL skill about self-regulation or self-management. It is important we teach students how to solve problems and provide them much guided practice so they can be competent problem solvers. So we're going to begin to model a problem solving process with a group of students that are are not really with us today, but Kim is going to represent them. So the first step in solving a problem is to stop and use calm down breath. Notice we call on our calm down breath skill again, this time to prepare our brains for the difficult task of problem solving. The calm down breath helps us identify the particulars of the problem. This helps to reduce confusion an overwhelming feeling of having a problem. Now that we are calm, having taken our calm breath, we name the problem and state related important information. We breathe, we breathe for calm focus first. And now Kim, you've done your breathing. Can you identify the problem you would like some help in solving? I don't know which kind of school I wanna to go to this year. Um, I'm, I, um, I don't know anyone in online school and I don't know where my friends are going to school. Um, and I like my old school. So I'm not sure to do about what to do about going back to school this year. Hmm. It sounds like you want some help stating the real problem. Okay. Yeah. It, it just looks like a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. The problem is you need to say which kind of schooling you want this year and it's either in person or a hybrid of in person and online. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, we have to choose. We have to choose by a certain date. Okay. Once the problem has been specifically identified, it is important to observe the emotions related to the problem. Kim, what emotions do you experience when you think of going back to in person schooling? Um, I'm feeling a little bit nervous, but I'm kind of excited too, um, but just not feeling very content. Mm. What emotions do you experience when you think of going to do, to do school online? Um, I, I feel okay, but, um, I probably feel more nervous about online school and, and more happy or satisfied with in-person schooling. Wow, so what is your goal in solving the problem? Mm, I think I wanna be able to tell my parents which kind of school I want to go to and, and what I think might be best for me. Very good. So we have to consider a variety of solutions so we can find the right solution to your problem. 
When students can solve their own problems, they are empowered. The teacher need not be disturbed to solve the problem for them. But now we consider some possible solutions. Kim, what are some possible solutions to your problem that you thought of? For example, the, the first one about in school, about in-person schooling. What's, what are some of the problems? With I could go back to, yeah, I could go back to, I could go back to in-person schooling, um, but then I might be worried about uh, getting sick or um, I might not be able to see my friends, like my friends not, might not be in my class. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe I wouldn't be able to learn as well. I don't, I don't know. So what would be another solution to your problem? Um, I could, uh, I could do like online school, but if I did online school, um, I, I, I might be more um, distracted and not get as much learning done and kind of maybe waste my time on a computer or um, I might get into a computer and then I probably wouldn't get to see my friends if mm. I was doing um, online school. Wow, this problem is very complicated. We, we educators must also consider consequences as we prepare a response to the problem. We don't want to cause other problems, but we do want to be sure our problem can be solved and resolved. Now, consider what are the possible consequences, Kim, for each of your solutions. The first one was about in-person schooling. What might be some consequences if you go with that? Um, I, I think, again, I think that might be where I might get sick or um, maybe I won't get to be with my friends. They'll, they'll do online school and I'll be doing in-person school. So oh, maybe they right. won't, um, I won't see them at school. Um, okay. But I think for, for that, that's probably my main consequences that might happen there. Okay. What consequences do you think might happen if you do go with a hybrid school of both in, in person and online? I don't know if I'll learn as much and if I have trouble with my computer at home or um, I, I have to share my computer with my sister so I must, might not have enough time to get my schoolwork done. Um, so there could be problems there too. Phew. All right, we review all the possible solutions and their consequences and we choose the solution we think will work the best. So ask yourself, will it solve your problem, Kim? Now's the time to consider the best plan for putting the best solution into action. What might be your best plan for putting a solution into action to solve your problem, Kim? Um, I think going back to in-person learning probably is the one that would probably make me feel best. Because mm. I, miss, I miss my teachers and I miss being with my classmates. Mm -hmm. So now you, can plan, now you can make a plan to tell your parents your choice of school for the year. You can try it out and test your choice on how well it worked for you after several weeks or months. Your problem is solved and it will be evaluated later, tried some more, or a new choice of school will be tried later. So this problem solving protocol is from the PATHS program, which is an SEL program, and it's listed in one of your handouts that you will receive. So you will see each of the steps that I'm gonna review for you now. We actually went through each of these steps. We stopped and calmed down. We identified the problem with lots of related information. We identify the feelings involved with it and decided on a goal. We thought of solutions. We tried them out. We thought about consequences if we chose this solution over this solution. And we chose what we thought is the best solution to the problem. Kim made a plan to go tell her parents about it and register for, for her choice of schooling and then later on, she and her family and teachers would evaluate that whole plan and decide what would be next. So the problem solving protocol can also be helpful when the group is considering uncertain times such as a potential of a new pandemic. The process helps open students' minds to new ways of viewing things and takes lots of practice. So we often take time to practice problem solving with our group. 
And that brings us to our final activity here, which is about an optimistic closing. So our time together is coming to an end and we are grateful for your time and attention. Oh. That's all right. I, I apologize, I put the wrong poll. One, okay. one minute. So Kim is putting up our final poll and um, I want to tell you that one moment here, I have to, okay. So Castle recommends that group gatherings be brought to a comfortable and positive close with the facilitation of something called an optimistic closing. In this case here, we're asking you to respond to a poll by thinking about which of these SEL skills you want to share with others for use in the first days of school. This promotes optimism because there is forward action required in your response. And we'll give you time now to uh, respond to that poll and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. Thank you, everybody. Judy, if you want to go ahead and we can start taking questions and answers, I'll leave the poll open just for a few more minutes. Um, so Emily, if you're there, you wanna share with us some of the questions? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Judy and Kim, for all of your great information. We have had so many questions roll in. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> there's some good ones, and I'm sure you'll appreciate them too. First and foremost, Judy, could you tell us again the name of that ball that we used to practice our breath? Hoberman, H-O-B-E-R-M-A-N. It's, it's not too expensive. They come in a couple sizes. Uh, they're very useful for other things. It's really a math tool, but in this case, it's a breathing tool. Perfect. That was a perfect representation and a lot of people really <laughs> liked that one. So great, great Good. use there. Mm -hmm. We had quite a few questions about how to do the speaker tool in a virtual setting and also in classroom when we really can't be passing things back and forth. Mm. So... Um, I will say that we had lots of great suggestions in our chat as well. So if you guys would like to tune in first or join in first, I'll also share some of the things that our uh, attendees have said after you're finished. Oh, good, good. Um, so virtually there are other tools online, like a hands up. I'm, I think most of you have found that in Zoom calls. So instead of holding the power, you're raising your hand to receive the power. And in a Zoom setup, the person in charge, which would be a teacher, would limit, it automatically limits the, the time to the person who raised their hand and was uh, acknowledged. Um, the piece about passing in the classroom, Kim, I don't know if you have any great, that's one I hadn't actually thought about that you really can't be sharing things between yeah. students. So it's a great question to I consider. Think, yeah, I think that I think that maybe you could have something, um, I've seen like little, uh, maybe like a little paddle on the desk that each child had. And when it was mm. there, when it was Perfect. Speaking, they could hold their paddle up to say it's my turn. So maybe it's a picture of their face or whatever you wanted to get created, a, a, a tongue depressor, but you could give each child something. And then when it was their turn, they could use their own speaker power tool. That's awesome. Perfect. And Kim, that suggestion was one of the really popular ones that was presented in the chat. Also something like their pencil, uh, a, a personal object that they like as if they are in a virtual setting. So mm -hmm. each student would have something that meant something to them. The popsicle stick, like I said, was a very popular answer. And the raise the hand feature in things like Zoom um, was also, again, really popular. And we definitely appreciate you guys taking the consideration of how to keep your students safe if they are in the classroom setting. So thank you guys so much for sharing all those great ideas. Um, I will say one last one uh, that just showed up for me too was that you can have your students unmute and ask them to unmute and then they can ask to unmute. And so the educator can then unmute students one by one to hopefully also uh, limit any distractions. True, but is, is it the uh, educator controlling it at that point? They As opposed to empowering students? 
true. It would have to be done one at a time okay. um, from the educators. Uh, control panel. You can see we're all in this this area of trying to problem solve so many of these things. So we just have to keep being creative and solve our problems. Exactly, exactly. So I had another question pretty early on about the character agreements. How could you do that virtually? I'm sorry, I'm the, sure. charter, the Charter of Common Agreements. Right. I, 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 um, I can, I can, I'll, I'll jump in. There's sure. actually some really great apps with uh, sticky notes that you can put all the students' names in, and they have their own little sticky note where they could provide their suggestions. And visually on the screen when it's shared, you can see all of those suggestions. And then you as the teacher could go ahead and create your list based on all of the work that the students one idea that I had. I love it. Kim, I think this one comes closer to you. In early in the presentation, you showed a slide with, ha, that talked about the study of predictive outcomes of SEL skill uh, establishments. Could, does that mm -hmm. bring into people of color or a diverse background for that study? Um, what I know about that study is that it was a large research project that was longitudinal over many years because obviously if you're going to follow um, young people in their kindergarten and you're also going to learn about them when they are um, much later in life um, that you have to you have to follow them along and so um, if I'm remembering correctly and Judy can fill in for me that there were um, urban sites and rural sites and and multiple sites as part of this very very large research project mm -hmm. and so um, that that is taken into uh, if, in, into context but I definitely would encourage you to uh, look up that specific research and dive into that a little bit deeper if you're interested in knowing more specifically about the participants in that research study. Right, it's a really important question. Um, but it, like you said, Kim, over time, so many years have come and gone and these kids were followed, which is pretty cool. But it would stay in the, in the early part of the study, um, basically how they describe those, those individual students. So you can check there. That I don't recall. Sorry. No, I understand that the, a lot of the studies are a little bit older, so, but mm -hmm. I definitely wanted to touch base just in case you guys remember. Sure. Uh, one more question for you is, do you have any suggestions about creating the calming corner right at the student's desk? Given the social distancing guidelines, there will not be a lot of movement allowed to happen in the classroom. Okay. Yeah, I can take the stab at this first if you'd like. All right, go ahead. Um, so I, I have a, a little tool that I used um, with students in the classroom where we created an individual envelope for each of the students. And inside that envelope, we would brainstorm the things that they needed to help calm themselves down. So they could choose their own individual ideas with obviously some guidance from um, the teacher and, and myself. And they would put them on little strips of paper or draw a picture um, and they would we call that their toolbox and so they would keep that toolbox at their desk and if they had a problem or they needed to calm down they could open up their toolbox and the physical act of going through those slips of papers or those pictures gave them a chance to um, calm down but then they could also choose the strategy that they were going to use at their desk to calm themselves down um, so and that worked really effectively with the students I worked with. So between that and the speaker power and any others that you had there, they are creating a really cool toolbox right there on their desk. I think that's awesome. I think we have time for one more question. And Kim, this is for you. Um, how can we get the SEL assessment survey tool? Um, if you're interested in learning more about the DESA, you can reach out to Aperture Education. And let me go ahead and I'll, um, move the slide forward so that I did not move the slide forward here to show you how to reach out to us if you have questions. So um, if you have questions, if you'd like to get in contact with Judy related more to some of the skills and strategies that she talked about today, 
please feel free to reach out to her. Her information is there. Uh, and Judy has such a great knowledge and is so willing to share her knowledge because she's so passionate about helping kids. So um, she'll be happy to uh, help you there. And then if you're interested in knowing more about SEL assessment and the DESA, please reach out to us at Aperture Education and we'll be happy to talk you through um, how you can um, put those things together, how you can use SEL in your classroom and support it through um, assessment as well. All right, that brings us right to three o'clock. So we are at the end wow. of our time. Perfect. So I appreciate both of your inputs here. We've, this has been a great presentation. The chat has been filled again with questions and thank yous. And I definitely appreciate all the time you put into this. So thank you both so much. Thank Judy you all. Yeah, thank you all. If we did not get to your question, I will be having a team member from Aperture Education be reaching out with your answers. Also be looking for the presentation uh, slide deck as well as the handouts from Judy and a couple from Kim and Aperture Education as well. That will be coming out this afternoon and you'll also be receiving that certificate of attendance within 24 hours and I expect it to be this afternoon as well. Wow. So from all of us at Aperture Education on, on behalf of Judy, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate everybody's support. Go do SEL. <laughs>